It's a passage in the canon. A short verse. A monk in his hut during a rainstorm. And he's saying, my hut is well thatched, so go ahead and rain as much as you like. That's a symbol for a mind that's well trained. Can deal with any situation, no matter how good or bad things are outside. The mind is protected. The good and bad things can't penetrate the mind. The Pali term for those things outside is lokadama. The dhammas of the world. And most people's minds are not only penetrated by these things, they're totally overwhelmed. Gain, loss, status, loss of status, praise, criticism, pleasure and pain. These things are constantly raining down on us. And most people are out in the open, totally exposed. No protection at all, thinking gain must be good, loss must be bad. Status is good, loss of status is bad. Praise is good, criticism is bad. Pleasure is good, pain is bad. And the minds are totally overwhelmed with whatever comes their way. But as, I, as we all know, these things come in pairs. None of them last forever. They keep changing. This is why we need to train the mind, so we can separate ourselves from them, so we can have that well-thatched roof that protects us from the rain, the walls that protect us from the wind. And part of it is just learning how to get yourself inside the hut. In other words, learning how not to identify with these things. There's a great story from John Fu. One night he was out, out in the woods. And when you set up your umbrella tent as a forest monk, you make a vow that once you've set it up, you're not going to move, you're not going to change, no matter what, which means that you're very careful before you set it up. You check the weather, you look all around the area to see if there are any ants or other insects that are going to bother you. And only then do you set up your umbrella tent. He said there were no clouds at all in the evening, so I figured it would be a nice night to be out in the open. So in a case like that, you run a, a line from one tree to another and hang your tent from the line. He said in the middle of the night, he doesn't know where it came from, a huge storm blew up. So he immediately gathered all of his robes, except for one, put them in his bowl so they'd stay dry. He just sat there with one under robe. And the theme of his meditation was, the body may be wet, but the mind isn't wet. Then he was able to get the mind to settle down and be still and stay not wet throughout the evening. In other words, he didn't dwell on the theme of the wetness out there didn't take it in, in terms of identifying with things outside, and the, the body counts as outside as well. That's how we got through the night. So an important part of this is learning how not to identify with things that are subject to gain and loss, status, loss of status. Don't make them part of your self-identity. Learn how to see them simply as lokadamas. These are aspects of the world. They're not aspects of your mind. And if you don't identify with them, then you're not exposed to them. And then you can learn how to use them. They are tools, all of them. The usefulness of gain and status and praise and pleasure, that's obvious. Although we usually don't use them very skillfully. gain comes, people tend to identify with it. 
becomes part of their self-image, rather than seeing that this is something of the world that has come their way. And the question is, how are you going to squeeze the best use out of it? It doesn't mean squeezing as much pleasure as you can. It means squeezing what is actually useful. How can you train your mind using your gains? In other words, what's the best way to be generous with them? When loss comes, what can you learn from that? There are good lessons to be learned. As long as you don't keep your identity all tied up in the loss. One good thing you can learn when you're going through a state like that is who are your true friends? Who are the people who are willing to help you even though they can't see any immediate gain coming from it? And that's a good lesson to learn. When you're going around wealthy, you don't know who your friends are. You're exposed. I've known people born into extremely wealthy and powerful families, and they always seem very uncertain. Who can they trust? There are always people trying to take advantage of them one way or another. So going through periods of loss is good for sorting out who your friends are. Staying with status and loss of status. When you gain status, you're gaining in power. What's the best use of that power? In other words, what will give them the greatest long-term benefits? When you've lost that status, again, you learn who your friends are. When praise comes, what's the use of the praise? Actually, criticism is a lot more useful than praise, for two reasons. One, you may actually learn things about yourself that you otherwise didn't know. We tend to be very blind to our, our weaknesses, our failings, the areas where we really need to do work. Part of us may know, but I figure as long as nobody else is, not, is noticing, it doesn't really matter. So sometimes it's good to get some criticism so I realize okay, where you've gone out of bounds, or where you're lacking something. As the Buddha said, when someone points out one of your faults, regard that person as someone who's pointed out treasure. You've got something you can work on. As for the criticism that's not true, well, you've learned something about the person who criticized you. Which is always a useful lesson. It may not be a lesson we want to learn or like to learn, but it's a good lesson to learn. Who has a grudge against you? Who is unfair to you? It's a good lesson to know. As for pleasure and pain, notice how the Buddha uses them, because they both have their uses. We tend to take pleasure as a goal in and of itself. We want as much pleasure as we can get. We're pretty indiscriminate. The Buddha has to sort out, though, what kind of pleasures are actually harmful and which ones are harmless. The main harmless ones are the ones that are based on getting the mind in a concentration. I guess it's a pleasure the way you're not in conflict with anybody. As I mentioned this morning, when you're sitting here, when you're sitting here looking at your breath, nobody's trying to elbow you out of the way so they can see your breath. It's totally yours. It's this entire field you have for exploring, reaping what pleasure you can. And that's a very rare kind of pleasure in the world. You're not creating any bad karma with anybody. You're not creating any unskillful mental states. There may be a slight attachment. There could be a strong attachment, but it's a healthy attachment. You hear warnings about the dangers of concentration. Well, it's usually concentration that's devoid of mindfulness, concentration that's devoid of alertness. Concentration that's got ulterior motives. 
But the concentration in itself is neither good nor bad. It's how you look at it, what you're trying to get out of it, that makes all the difference. And the dangers of concentration are much less than the dangers of all the other things we're attached to, all the sensual pleasures. The Canon of the Buddha has long, long lists of the dangers of sensual pleasures. The dangers of concentration, you really have to track down a sutta that talks about them. The primary one notes that once you've got your mind in concentration, then, then you try to incline it towards letting go of your identity views. The mind may not leap up at the idea of letting go. In other words, you're still attached to the concentration. But again, the fault is not with the concentration, it's with your unwillingness to let it go. Compared with the dangers of sensual pleasures. People kill one another with sensual pleasures. We have wars over sensual pleasures. Societies break apart over sensual pleasures. Families break apart. People work themselves to death, or in their quest for wealth, they push them to all sorts of extremities. I've been reading about Arctic exploration, the dream of gold up in the Arctic killed who knows how many people. Nobody gets killed over jhana. So it's a useful pleasure. It's a healthy pleasure. Blameless. It's part of the path. We learn to use this pleasure to get the mind in a position where it can really look into the other side of the equation, which is pain, which the Buddha said is a noble truth. When the mind has a good sense of well-being, it can look at pain in line with what the Buddha said is the true path. <coughs> excuse me, the true task. So we have stress and pain, which is to learn how to comprehend it. If you're afraid of it, if you run away from it, if you try to push it away, you're not going to comprehend it. Comprehending comes with looking at it, seeing what it is, and seeing where you're still passionate for something that causes stress, that causes pain. Don't you learn how to feel dispassion for whatever that is, because that's when you've really comprehended it. So in the case of all of these dhammas of the world, the important thing is to learn how to use them. They have their uses, as long as you don't identify them. They're tools you can use. It's like that water, the rain. You learn how to keep it in jars. You learn how to build a, a holding tank. You can use the rain to irrigate your crops. You can use the rain to feed yourself, to bathe yourself. In other words, the water does have its uses at the right time, as long as you're not exposed to these things, soaking them up all the time. Then you're okay. So as we're meditating, we're trying to develop that well-thatched roof, the ability to keep the mind focused on the breath, and the right attitudes that allow us to look at these affairs of the world and realize they're not really us, they're not really ours, they're just part of the world. It's like money. You may have money in your pocket, but it's not really yours. It's printed by the government. You look at the money and see, does it have your name written on it? Well, no, it's got other people's names. If the government wanted to change the value, they could do it. If they wanted to call it back, they could do it. While you've got it, you use it, and you try to use it as wisely as possible. But you realize this is all part of the world. Once you can make that distinction, then it's a lot easier to live in the world and not soak up all the problems of the world. You can live in your hut, it's well thatched, the rain may be falling all around. You can set out jars, you can take the rain off the roof and put it in a, in a tank. 
get some use out of it. Which is much wiser than just going out and walking in the rain, keeping yourself exposed all the time without any shelter at all. So it's a combination of having this place to stay with the breath and having the right attitudes toward all the things that would pull you away. That's how you learn how to thatch your roof. <laughs>